Evening to you, Greg, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Roland Dane to Inside Supercar this evening. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here. We've seen you in our paddock, on the pit wall, on the radio. We've chatted to you for the last 13 years. You've been a very prominent part of supercar success in the recent past. What we don't know is much about what predates that, and that's the fundamental reason why we wanted to get you here this evening. How did you catch the racing bug in the first instance? Yeah, I... Um I started racing bikes, motorcycles, when I was um, 18 and uh, carried on doing that for about five years. I uh, wasn't very good at it, <clears throat> enjoyed it a lot, but I wasn't stupid enough, I think, to actually be really good at it. And um, at the same time, I was working for a, for a company called Panther Cars, making bespoke uh, hand-built cars in the south of England, and um, I ended up building my first uh, competition car when I was 20, which was a, uh, a rally car, Group 4 rally car with Vauxhall components, GM in, in the UK. And then um, I uh, also built a production sports car in 1980 as part of my remit at, at work. So I was a very lucky boy to be able to play at racing at an early age there um, for a, a very successful driver in the UK called Chris Meek, who actually died a couple of weeks ago. Um, but uh, we won a championship straight off and he taught me what to do and what not to do. So most people aren't aware of this fact that you in fact did a lot of driving at one stage, didn't you? Yeah, I didn't do as much as I thought I should have done, but that was because uh, it was funds limited or family limited or whatever. But I drove for um, about 13 years on four wheels and about five years on two. And there's a shot of you, in fact, up on screen here at the moment in conversation with Derek Warwick, who is a, a long-time pal. But seeing you in a race suit is something that we're not accustomed to, RD. It's a, a bit of amusement in that for us. So who was the equivalent of Roland Dane in your ear in those days? Who was the headmaster whipping you along? Yeah, I mean, Derek actually um, owned that team through his, uh, through his Honda franchises. He had, at that time, he had three or four, um, f I think, four Honda dealerships in the UK and, and Jersey, where he lives. So he was, it, I was reporting to him then, trying to explain what was going wrong. <laughs> Hard to imagine you in that role, I can't believe it. So where was the transition from driver to team owner and why? I mean, did you just, was it a self-assessment and you went, you know what, I'm just not good enough at this? Or what was the story? Yeah, in it, it, early 90s, I, you know, I was still enjoying driving and not doing as much of it and doing some one-offs in the course of, of business. I was doing some driving in Japan, which is a lot of fun as well. But uh, I knew I wasn't good enough. <laughs> and I started uh, supporting a couple of other people, um, started owning a couple of cars, and then um, really consolidated it all at the in beginning of 2000, sorry, 1996. Um, and when I was at the Australian Grand Prix with Martin Brundle, actually, as, as his guest, I think it was the first Melbourne Grand Prix, and he and uh, John o. Palmer and I were sitting in the back of the garage in a practice session, and they were saying, what are you going to do with Derek now? And, uh, and Martin said, you need to get some manufacturer money behind you. And out of that, I went back and said to Derek, look, maybe we should try and make something bigger out of what he had in his dealership Honda team. And we went to Honda and said, can we run your BTCC team for you? Uh, and they said no. But uh, GM rang up and said, I gather you want to do something along these lines. Um, would you put a prop to us? So uh, Derek and I and Ian Harrison put that to them and, uh, and landed that deal. And is that where the name Triple Eight started? Oh, Triple Eight uh, is the name because we had to think of a name and I hated uh, names that were linked to people's names. And... Uh, I've been very successful in Asia and have been over many years and nothing they like better up there than Triple Eight. Right. So tell me about the parallel business career that you've had in concert with your motor racing because clearly that's also given you the means to do what you're now doing. Yeah. Um, I've Ever since I stopped working for, for Panther in the, in the mid-80s, my own business is actually 30 years old this year. Uh, I set up at the beginning of 1986 uh, in London, and, and that buys and sells uh, vehicles, expensive vehicles, all around the right-hand drive markets in the world. And it's ebbed and flowed um, enormously according to market conditions. But, um, you know, I own an industrial estate in the UK where it still operates from, and um, I've got the same eight people working for me 
for years and years. I can't remember the last one he left. Uh, and, um, uh, and that continues to, to thrive, frankly. Um, we've sold all sorts of specialist vehicles around the world. The British Touring Car Championship project that you spoke about before was pretty successful for you and Vauxhall was um, uh, a very successful relationship in your GM relationship. In fact, I can remember at one stage you guys came out here and I think Russell Ingle drove in one of your cars, did he not? He did. He smashed it into, <laughs> into, the, into the wall um, coming off Skyline. Yeah. It's, so, it's so hard to understand and imagine. It's, I can't believe that. <laughs> Yeah, he was slow as well. Greg Murphy was, <laughs> Murph was quick. Uh, Rus Russell was a, was a bit average, and it was front wheel drive. He didn't really understand. That. No right of reply either, which makes the interview even tastier. Until the weekend. But yes, that's right. But you guys, uh, you genuinely were very successful over a long period of time. So I'm curious then as to you know you're in the UK. Uh, there's a big motorsport industry hubbed in that part of the universe. Mm. What then triggered the notion of coming to Australia, and why? Uh, look, there are a number of things going on it that, uh, that ended up aligning at the same sort of time. I mean, I was, uh, went through a divorce and these things can be a bit painful at the time. Um, I needed some new direction. Uh, British touring cars had got very boring. The cars were dumbed down. Uh, they were um, easy to drive by comparison with the super touring cars. Uh, etc. And I wanted something different to do. And I'd fallen in love with Australia you know, years before when I'd first come out here. Uh, my grandfather was Australian, my brother's an Australian in the Northern Territory. He's a flying doctor up there. So um, overall, I, I had good enough reasons to want to come and dig around, see if I could do something down here. So uh, exactly, that's exactly what I did and came and had a look. And in the first instance, it was pretty tough, wasn't it? So when you guys first turned up here, mm. it certainly wasn't a case of transposing what you'd done in the UK and all of a sudden we're at the front of the field. It was hard yards early on. We had to, by we, I mean essentially myself and Ludo Lacroix, um, we had to learn what was important um, uh, in building and running the cars here. And that really took us 2004. Uh, that year was all about trying to learn and understand the series, the category, the cars, the uh, methodology um, and what was important to, to try and put, um, put wins together. And, and in 2005 it started to, uh, to roll properly. And you've always had a partnership in this business, haven't you, from the very beginning. And Derek Warwick, who, as I mentioned before, has been a long-time friend of yours, he was part of it in the early days. He, he, he was a, a, a shareholder originally, as was another old friend from Ireland, Peter Butterley, um, etc. Um, these days the shareholding has, has changed and um, uh, my business in the UK is a significant shareholder, uh, but um, also Paul Dumbrell and Tim Miles, now, now owner, a small part of the business as well as part of my insurance for the future, I suppose. What do you mean by that? Oh, I'm getting old and uh, I'm getting older, funnily enough, each year. <laughs> and the, uh, I, I really want to make sure that I've got a succession plan in place. Um, my daughter, younger daughter, works for the business. And, um, but it's all a big family at the end of the day. As anyone who's had a successful race team of this size uh, I don't think you can say that about a Formula One team anymore, but you used to be able to. Um, where you've got sort of 48, 49 people working for you, it is a big family. And I don't want to see those people left in the lurch if I'm silly enough to do something stupid and drop off my perch. There was a wonderful shot up on screen just a few moments ago of your youngest daughter, Jessica, with the late Paul Warwick, uh, yeah. Derek's younger brother, who sadly passed in an incident at Alton Park, uh, you, and you had a great relationship with him there. It's curious yeah. that Jessica's been around for so long and here she is yeah. uh, still involved in the business to this very day with a senior role. Yeah, well, Paul, Paul died 25 years ago next month. Mm. That was uh, May, so two months before it happened. That was May 1991, that photo. And Jessica, yeah, she's been a part of motorsport um, all her life, as you can see. Mm. I want to go through some of the results um, in the modern era. 404 race starts for Triple Eight Race Engineering for 147 wins, 93 poles, six titles, six Bathurst wins, five Sandown 500s, four Clipsal wins. First remark off the back of that is congratulations, but what next? What's the next challenge? Uh, the next challenge I, I actually alluded to 
earlier. The next challenge for me, or the big chapter, is to try and keep the success rate, but be able to hand it over to the next generation over the next five, six, seven years or so. And, um, and, and really ensure that I've got a group of people in place and a, uh, systems and a methodology that can stand the test of time. You're a tough character. We see it on television and we can tell by the look in your eye in the background, keeping an eye on your flock, making sure they're doing what you want them to do. Is that uh, a formula that works for you personally? Is that, just a, is that an extension of your personality? Just give me a little insight into the way in which you work. Um, I can't do that too much. I'd let everyone into the secrets. Um, I, it's, it's just an, a technique or, or a style that's evolved from watching the people that I thought were really, really good at it. And I've been lucky enough to be around some really good operators trying to pick up the titbits over the years. You know, a lot of time spent going to race meetings and being around Formula One and world sports cars with Derek gave me an insight into how some very good operators ran the teams. You know, people like Jean Todd at the height of his powers in the Peugeot team uh, before he went to Ferrari, um, or Ross Braun at, uh, in the Walkinshaw uh, era with the um, Jaguar sports mm. car program Supercars. and at Arrows before that. Um, it, you could really see how, how good people in a, a completely different world from what we live in in Formula One today, one that was much closer to our world in terms of the size of operations and everything and the way they were run, how they worked. Is there a sense of humour in there somewhere? Um, I think there's a, a pretty big sense of humour, but, um, but I, I like to be with the people I like to be with. And uh, when I'm with the right people, then, uh, yeah, we can have a lot of fun. And you know, would you stop and consider doing something other than supercars now, or is this it? Is this is this the full stop in your effectively your racing career? Uh, it, it probably is the thing that I would have really enjoyed, uh, um, I believe, doing and, and did have a serious look at uh, was being involved in in motorcycles at, at, at MotoGP, and I. I actually went in 2011 to, to Silverstone on an exploratory trip uh, to MotoGP there um, yeah, with Derek and with a couple of, of other people who would have been key investors in it too, from a sponsor point of view, to look at it. And it, it didn't, didn't go anywhere, but it was uh, that, that's a box I would have liked to have ticked. Pleasure to spend time with you this evening. Thank you very much for that. Have fun this weekend in Darwin and hope you can continue to add to those numbers. Where's your qualifying mojo gone, by the way? Because you guys have lost that form this year. Wait and see. Anyway, there's no points for quali. But wait it does, and see. It does convert to race wins, though, doesn't it? It quite often does, but uh, wait and see. All right. Thanks, Roland. Appreciate Thank your you. time.